Common knowledge truly is a major driver of human relationships. Now, of course, no mortal can actually entertain in his head, I think that he thinks that I think that he thinks that I think. I mean, you start to get a headache after one or two I thinks that he thinks. But we don't have to, because there are ways in which common knowledge can be um, perceived, can be ascertained from the actual situation. Namely, if there is something that is uh, salient, a little boy blurts something out, someone appears in the middle of a crowd, and you see it, you see other people seeing it, then it instantly generates the mental equivalent of, I know that he knows that I know that he knows that I know that he knows. That's part of the psychology of demonstrations and, and mass turnout. Why is freedom of assembly enshrined as a fundamental right in a democracy? And why are dictators often terrified of a popular demonstration? They'll often be sent packing even though the people don't have any armaments or actual power. And one of the reasons is that no dictatorship can terrorize every single citizen. They just don't have the firepower. But they can intimidate each person who stands up. If everyone stands up at once, then they can overwhelm the uh, autocrat, but no one would be willing to be the first to stand up unless they had reason to believe that other people would, but they wouldn't unless they in turn had reason to think that everyone else opposes the dictatorship. By having everyone show up at once with a common uh, signal, uh, that generates the common knowledge everyone sees, that everyone sees, that everyone else sees, that they're disgruntled with the dictator. And so the public demonstrations have a, a special role in uh, social change. But conversely, public event can also paradoxically lull people into apathy and inaction. And this brings up one of the classics in the psychology curriculum. Every student knows about the classic studies in bystander apathy, triggered by a real-life news event. Uh, in the 1960s, there was a notorious case of a woman named Kitty Genovese in New York who was stabbed to death in an apartment courtyard, according to the story. And according to the New York Times report, people watched the murder uh, happen from their windows. No one called the police. Uh, it was considered a classic case of uh, alienation and apathy and uh, callousness and inhumanity. Pe Op-eds were written about it, a lot of hand-wringing about how people could have allowed this to happen. A couple of famous psychologists, uh, John Darley and Bib Latine, had a slightly different idea. They thought it wasn't that people were callous or cruel or indifferent or apathetic, but that responsibility was diffused by the mere fact that so many people were watching the crime unfold at the same time. And they did a number of famous studies where uh, if there was an emergency and there was one person, they would always report it. If there were a number of people, then if the uh, other bystanders were trained confederates of the experimenter, ignored the emergency, so would the real subject. It's a metaphor, but it doesn't really explain why responsibility should diffuse like some kind of fixed liquid. So Julian DeFreitas and Peter DeSholi and, and I had a, a slightly different idea. The literature and game theory had a scenario that they called the bystander's dilemma. Namely, when there are a number of people who are all in a position to help, and there's some cost to helping, you've got to get out of your routine, take out time, you might put yourself at risk. You would rather help the person at the cost of the inconvenience than uh, let the person suffer, but better still would be if someone else helped the person, because then you'd get the benefit of a clear conscience that the person was helped without all of the risk and inconvenience of you being the helper. Now, let's say everyone thought that. They really weren't callous, but they were a little bit uh, selfish and everyone was hoping that someone else would be the uh, first to step in. That gives you the bystander dilemma. Now, what is the optimal solution if you're in that circumstance? Well, it's to basically mentally flip a coin as to whether to do it and the about a weighted coin and the probability that you would help if it landed heads depends on how many other people are there. The more other bystanders there are, the lower the chance that you should help because chances are that someone else will be the one that will step in. 
That leads to what's called in game theory an outguessing standoff. That's when the, it's a kind of a discoordination game where the best outcome for each person is if the person that they're facing chooses something different. Like a kicker and a goalie in soccer, deciding whether to go left or to go right. The kicker wants the goalie to go left if he goes right and vice versa, and so on for the goalie. Or a game of scissors, paper, rock. The best strategy in an outguessing standoff is to be as random as possible. In an outguessing standoff, though, uh, common knowledge is necessary so that you know that other people know that there's someone in need and therefore you can hope that they'll be the one instead of you. And indeed, in the uh, original report of the Kitty Genovese murder, it turns out a lot of the facts were wrong, but at least in the way it was reported, it was in an apartment courtyard where there was common knowledge. Everyone could see the crime, everyone could see everyone else, everyone could hope that someone else would be the first to step in. So we use that neglected dependence on common knowledge to have a, a more innocuous version of a bystander scenario. A landlord that uh, needed help in reading a meter, and each of the tenants would hope that someone else would uh, be the one to read the meter. What we found was, indeed, when there was uh, common knowledge, people shirked, uh, and the more other people there were that could step in, the more likely they were to shirk. But when there was private knowledge, when you knew that the landlord needed help, you knew that other people knew, but you knew that they didn't know that you knew. That is, there is knowledge short of common knowledge. Well, now you are sitting pretty. Even though you knew that, uh, that help was needed, you knew that other people didn't know that you knew, so they would be on the hook, not you. And the more knowledge that you had that other people knew, without knowing that you knew, the less likely people were uh, to help. In contrast, if you knew that everyone else didn't know, then you'd be on the hook, and indeed, people did volunteer in those circumstances. So once again, common knowledge, a notion from, from philosophy, from economics, from game theory, turns out to provide a, a key to unlocking a mystery in human social life.